Hi everyone, I hope you can hear me. Um, I'm going to get started with my presentation. Uh, that was a really great introduction from Caitlin, so I appreciate that. Um, as she said, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology. Um, I'm sort of a content expert, if you will, in violence towards women and rape culture. Um, I also do some research in pornography and I've worked in institutional corrections. So my experience really runs the gamut, uh, but the bulk of my research I would say sort of correlates to what we're going to be chatting about tonight. Um, I've spoken quite a bit on this topic, um, not only to college students like yourselves from across the country, um, but to those in the field who are working as practitioners, um, with those who have been experienced sexual violence, with domestic violence and stalking. Um, I've even done sort of these sorts of talks with inmates in Washington State Department of Corrections. So I've sort of had a really unique sort of birth of experiences um, sort of help me navigate not only this conversation, but um, ones in a variety of circles. Um, as Caitlin noted, um, I've been published uh, on this topic quite a bit. You know, I've had my sort of uh, head wrapped around this topic for many years now. Uh, so all my experiences therein are really rooted in not only my research, but the bulk of the research that I've been looking at and consuming for the past several years. Um, a couple of things you should know about me just personally, because we're gonna be talking about some pretty um, heavy topics tonight. I want you to know a little bit about me as a presenter. Uh, I'm from New York State originally, um, upstate uh, to be exact. So I have a tendency to talk kind of fast. That's just my East Coast sign of mentality. I'm gonna to try to slow that down tonight to the best of my ability, but know that that's you know, sort of where I'm hailing from. Uh, another thing you should know about me is that I have a cat named Plankton, and it's one of those work hard so your cat can have a better life situation. So I'm achieving all of these great things, but I do that for my son who happens to be a cat. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to give you that sort of background on me, not only personally and professionally, because um, this topic can get quite heavy uh, as it progresses. And you know, you should know that there's a human here who's talking to you about this and who's talked about this quite extensively in a number of circles. Um, so before I move on, I'm actually gonna shut my camera off because it's a little weird for me to be staring at my own face. So <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and do that now, but know that you can ask me questions um, and I'll try to answer them towards the end. Um, another thing here is I'm gonna try to make this as interactive as humanly possible. Um, and I'd love for you when I ask questions for you to answer those in the chat box for me so we can sort of make this a back and forth dialogue. So let's get started on the presentation. Um, I wanna offer a few reminders to you though before we get into the content, um, offer a trigger warning of sorts. Uh, as I said, this topic is really, really heavy and it can be intimidating for many and it can be overwhelming. Um, so know that, uh, be respectful of others in the room, be respectful of yourself throughout this presentation. Know that there may be survivors listening. Um, in on this presentation who have their own set of unique experiences. You know, I myself have been impacted by gender-based violence, so I understand sort of the trauma and the aftermath therein. So if you need to, you know, sort of take a step back while you're listening, go do something else for a minute and come back, I totally understand that. It can be very difficult to sort of talk about these topics. Um, you know, that being said, note that this presentation is going to contain some strong language and some rather unsettling anecdotes. Um, we're gonna be discussing sort of the nooks and crannies of rape culture, and I'm gonna be discussing with you sort of the more insidious elements therein. Um, so again, some strong language, be mindful of that. Um, I'm not doing it purposefully um, or maliciously simply to you know, give you this information as um, concretely as possible. Um, feel free to write down some questions. As I said, I'll have a Q&A portion at the end of the webinar, um, and I will try to address all of those questions at that time. Um, so let's get started. Um, we're having this conversation because sexual violence is a huge problem in our culture. One in five women and one in 16 men will be victims of sexual assault during their time at university. So violence, in general is rampant and sexual violence is even more so 
And I should note here that when I say things like sexual assault, what I mean is any sexual activity that lacks consent. So sort of hold that definition in your mind as we move through and sort of talk about rape culture, that it's really any sexual activity that's lacking consent. Um, research, recent research actually estimates that about 25 million adults in our culture have experienced sexual violence and that there's a huge economic toll, emotional toll, physical toll, and societal cost to, you know, these um, sort of experiences that a lot of people have. Um, and given these statistics, you know, it's obvious to me that we need to start examining what factors contribute to sexual violence in our culture. And for me, I, I believe that cultural factors are a major, major thing that's linking us to um, all of this sexual violence that we're seeing. And I would say I'm in good company. Uh, the United Nations, the World Health Organization, and the Centers for Z Disease Control and Prevention, they all know that cultural risk factors are related to sexual violence, that cultural norms that are supportive of violence and gender inequity can lead to sexual violence, or at least a culture that's supportive of that therein. Um, accordingly, I don't feel like we should simply address sexual violence on an individual level or a community level, but also on a cultural one. Because cultural mores impact individual attitudes and behaviors. And individual attitudes and behaviors taken collectively can impact culture and reinforce some of those negative stereotypes they're in. So let's talk about rape culture. Rape culture is a culture where gender-based violence, sexual violence, is pervasive, normalized, minimized, rationalized, lyricized, satirized, and condoned. Remember that rape culture is the infrastructure that enables violence to occur and validates it when it happens. It sort of misrepresents sex and gender-based violence as normal and expected. It silences victims. It exonerates perpetrators. So in terms of the tree diagram you're seeing here on the slide, I sort of see rape culture as the foundation or the roots, if you will, um, where it, it's sort of like linking all of these individual level and community level um, expressions of violence. Like you can imagine these little branches on the trees as individual expressions um, and whatever that may look like. So that could be um, an instance of sexual violence, maybe an, instant, an instance of intimate partner violence, um, and so on and so forth. So moving forward here, when we talk about rape culture, note that it's sort of pervasive in our culture to the point that we don't even necessarily recognize that we're steeped in it. Um, according to Jackson Katz, he's a famed scholar in the field. He does a lot of work around masculinity and violence and sexual violence. Um, he says that sexual violence is, quote, a pervasive social phenomenon with deep roots in the existing personal, social, and institutional arrangement, arrangements. And when violence is rationalized as normal and expected, the more likely it is to occur. So in other words, he's saying that sexual violence and rape culture have sort of a synergistic connection. Sexual violence is the foundation of rape culture, and rape culture normalizes sexual violence. However, this sort of produces a paradox. You know, this very normality makes it even harder to see that there's an actual problem taking place. And given that rape culture, specifically, um, you know, in our current sort of technology saturated, pornified popular culture, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is sort of passively condoned as fact. You know, young people are trained from very, very young ages to sort of see violence, specifically sexual violence perpetrated by men, as normal and expected. Um, so I actually recently read a study um, on young girls ages 3 to 17, and they were sort of questioning them as to, you know, what they felt about violence in their culture, and specifically men's violence. And some of the more startling findings were that these young girls saw men's violence as normal, and even more insidiously, they romanticized it. Um, and they also policed other young girls' responses to men's violence. Uh, so we see that young people are already being steeped into this culture and viewing sexual violence as normative and sometimes even romanticizing it. 
you know, and when I say romanticizing, it always makes me think of, oh gosh, um, Twilight. I forgot the title there for a second, the movie Twilight, where we see this sort of romanticizing of these stalking behaviors, um, where we see Edward sort of chasing after Bella in a really insidious way. Um, and we don't even recognize that. We sort of see that as romantic. And it's really more insidious than that when you really start to sort of peel back those layers. So let's continue on. I have a lot more examples here of rape culture that we can sort of talk about. But keep this sort of tree diagram in mind um, because we'll sort of be utilizing that throughout the evening. Oh, yes, and Kara H. actually just said, I'm looking at the chat box, yes, the Fifty Shades of Grey movie is actually a very good example, a more recent example um, of this sort of um, you know, dynamic where we're romanticizing men's violence. Very, very good, very good. Um, so I, I don't, I'm not trying to cite myself here, but I pulled a quote from one of the publications that I have that, you know, I sort of use quite frequently um, when met with any criticism um, around, uh, you know, me bringing up the topic of rape culture. So I say rape culture isn't the primary perpetrator of sexual violence. You know, there are individual people out there perpetrating these crimes. Um, and that's me having this conversation with you all tonight is not taking away from that, right? But I believe that rape culture is metaphorically driving the perpetrator to and away from the scene of the crime. So what do I mean by that? I think that we live in a culture, like I said, that sort of exonerates perpetrators and silences victims. Um, and we can talk and we will talk throughout the evening about how this is sort of exemplified um, in many ways in our culture. Um, but let me give you a few examples here. Um, I think that rape culture sort of creates an environment where women are targets of violence and the men who perpetrate it, again, walk away unscathed. And I think that it's even normalized. Sexual violence is normalized to the point where we don't even recognize it in our language. Um, I often hear younger people say things like um, when they're describing sexual activity, they'll say things like, oh, uh, hit that, beat that, tear it up, bang, pound, slay, smash. You know, so all these words that are just readily used um, to describe sexual activity that actually have a violent connotation. We just use these things so flippantly that we don't even recognize that. Um, another example of rape culture would be actually something I saw recently in the media. Um, there was a Brazilian soccer player, and I don't know if any of you saw this. He was recently returned to playing, or he had recently returned to playing soccer after he spent some time in prison. Now, he spent time in prison for torturing and murdering his ex-girlfriends. He spent many years behind bars. Um, he had done his time. But when he got back out, he was reinstated in soccer. And he was quoted as saying, well, mistakes happen. I'm not a bad guy. So what is rape culture telling us here? Rape culture is saying that someone can commit a horrendous act of gender-based violence that results in a murder. and it's okay, they can play soccer again, they can continue to, um, you know, sort of be glorified by fans and so on and so forth. Um, yes, I actually just seen Amber in the chat box here, she said same with NFL players. We, you know, we do see this a lot with um, pro athletes. Uh, maybe you're speaking, Amber, about uh, the Ray Rice video, um, where we saw him sort of um, engage in intimate partner violence with his then fiance, now wife, right? And sort of, he's still sort of lauded as um, a good football player. Um, moving on, uh, there's a bigger case here that I think we've all probably heard of in the media uh, that sort of is the exemplification. <laughs> yes, Karina, <laughs> I'm looking in the chat box now, Karina said Brock Turner. Yes, absolutely. The Stanford sexual assault case, where there was many things wrong with that case, many, many things. Um, one of which was in the first article, or one of the first articles that was written about the case, he was referred to as, quote, the Stanford swimmer, rather than suspected rapist or, you know, any of those language or any of the language that would defer to him, uh, given the actions he had partaken in. Um, and in fact, in one of the first articles that were written about him, his swim team times were listed because he was a swimmer at Stanford, and his team headshot was used, not his mugshot. Um, long story short, this sort of played out in the media. He went to court, went to trial. He was convicted and uh, was sentenced to six months in prison. He actually only served three months in prison, which um, was sort of a double-edged sword for those of us who work in the field of gender-based violence, because on one hand, 
yes, that is a very light sentence for sexual violence. On the other hand, we know that most perpetrators of sexual violence do not, absolutely do not spend any time um, behind bars or even trickle through the criminal justice system. Um, Another thing, you know, that we see in the media quite frequently is um, those in the political sphere sort of making comments about violence towards women that are pretty flippant, if not uh, just horrifically offensive. Um, so one Wisconsin politician was actually quoted as saying, and, and this was in response to um, him being asked about a recent sexual assault that had taken place in a high school um, in Wisconsin. And he said, quote, some girls rape easy. Um, so, you know, denoting that, you know, there are some victims out there who um, are more easily perpetrated against than others. Um, there was also a video of a certain pre presidential candidate who was quoted as saying that he wanted to quote, grab women by the pussy. Um, so all of these horrific things are sort of playing out um, in the media right now. Um, another example of rape culture, uh, you know, that I sort of see quite frequently is the use of demeaning language towards women. Um, we see that quite often. Um, and in fact, um, Jackson Katz, again, that scholar I noted earlier, he pointed out that, you know, we sort of flippantly use um, really horrific language towards women. And rightfully so, we will not use things like racial slurs, but we have no problem with calling women horrific names. So actually, Jackson Katz points out that Eminem, the rapper, he has made it a very um, sort of his point to not ever use racial slurs in his lyrics. Yet he has many lyrics that sort of <laughs> are the embodiment of violence towards women. Um, his song Kim in particular um, is pretty heinous in the fact that he is openly um, sort of disparaging and um, lyricizing abuse and violence. So I could go on for days <laughs> about how many examples of rape culture are out there. But what I really wanna do right now is sort of go into the individual elements that we see and we can tease out more examples from there. So there's no one piece of literature that sort of seemingly itemizes all the dynamics of rape culture very thoroughly. But my careful review of the literature has sort of allowed me to tease out some reoccurring themes that are sort of intimately connected to the proliferation of this culture that normalizes and minimizes violence towards women. So they're listed here. We're gonna go through them individually. Um, I'm gonna ask you some questions throughout, so I hope you participate. You all are doing a great job at doing that already. Um, but we're gonna talk about sexual objectification, rape myths, victim blame, risk reduction, slut shaming, harassment in its varying forms, and then media influences um, that sort of per perpetuate this culture of violence. So let's talk about the first one here, sexual objectification. So this occurs when a woman's body, and it's generally women who are uh, sexually objectified in our culture. Man can and are be, it can be objectified, but generally women are sort of the targets of this objectification. But this is sort of where a woman's body parts or certain elements of her are sort of separated out from her as a person, and she's viewed largely as a physical object of male desire. Um, so we see this sort of in a variety of ways play out in our culture. What I wanna ask you all now is if anyone can sort of think of any examples that they've seen of sexual objectification, specifically in the media, um, in real life too, but perhaps in the media, if you can think of anything. Perfume commercials, Amber said, absolutely, yes. We see that from, and specifically in the ads and magazines as well. Um, we see this sort of, um, objectification of certain body parts with perfume bottles. Um, Naya said the uh, Victoria's Secret commercials, Karina, very good, I was gonna actually mention that, the Carl's Jr. commercials. Um, oh, Olivia, yes, very good, the American Apparel ads are actually quite extreme um, in their objectification of women, and specifically when you put the American Apparel ads of men versus women up, it's this, the difference is quite startling. Um, yes, Chloe, fashion shows, absolutely. 
Um, Maria, magazines with cars and girls. Yes, very much so. Um, I always think of um, when I was in college and I went to get my car fixed at this local shop in New York and I walked in the garage and there was these fo like calendars of women, you know, next posing next to cars, so obviously very objectified. Um, Ashley said we were just watching the Iron Fist and I was surprised to see that the main character was often showed without his shirt on while his girlfriend was fully clothed. Good. That's a good example, actually, Ashley, of men being objectified um, sometimes uh, when women aren't. Um, Amber said alcohol ads and Tony said magazines. Yes, very good, everyone. Very good. Um, a couple of other ones I wrote down, um, which I was sort of chatting with some colleagues uh, about this morning, is this one always sticks out to me as sort of the epitome of sexual objectification. In the late 2000s, the Houston Press published an article called 10 hottest female sex offenders. I can't make that up. <laughs> Even after committing a sexual offense, women are being ranked and objectified <laughs> uh, based on their appearance. Um, another one that I sort of see sticks out in my, yes, Autumn said wow, yes, very much wow. <laughs> um, another thing that sort of sticks out for me um, is in sports, um, specifically the NFL versus how women play football. So there's something called the Women's Laundry Football League. I don't know if you all are familiar with that. Um, but in order for women to play football, um, apparently they have to be scantily clad. Um, and also another thing with boxing matches where you see the ring girls, quote unquote, sort of um, at the end of every round, they come out in either a bikini or uh, some other outfit and they sort of hold up the number of the round and, um, you know, keep things moving in that way. It's quite, it's fascinating for someone who does this research and um, it's horrifying for me as someone who identifies um, as a feminist. Um, oh, Courtney, yes, very good. I'm looking at the chat box. She said cheerleaders. Very good. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I want to note here, there, of course, are men who are cheerleaders, um, but we do see that women are wearing they more scantily clad outfits than um, men. You know, I should note here uh, before I move forward, I, I'm not pathologizing or shaming any individual, um, specifically women who may appear in these advertisements, maybe in music videos and in any other way that someone may be objectified. Because on an individual level, I think owning and expressing your sexuality is fantastic. You know, that's wonderful if you feel empowered to do that. But I think on a cultural level, when we take all of these images collectively, collectively, excuse me, they're ultimately disempowering for women. Um, I sort of think of it as like if sexuality and harnessing one's sexuality in those ways was an effective means to garner influence, power and respect, powerful men all over the world would do it all the time. Right. Um, uh, so that's what I sort of think of. Um, I'm looking at Autumn here in the chat box. You actually said a very good example that I, I missed is the deal or no do deal. Um, women on there and sort of game shows and that, that sort of thing. We absolutely do see those images quite frequently. Um, in the interest of time, I have to move on. I tend to want to talk about these <laughs> things for quite a long period of time. So let's keep it moving. Um, so sexual objectification is one. Um, the next one here, Rape myths are inherent to rape culture. So these are widely held, albeit deeply inaccurate, beliefs about sexual assault. So the one that I actually didn't put on here that I want to sort of start with first is the first rape myth that I sort of see is rape is always about sex. That's what we sort of hear. Um, but no, it's actually about power and control. Um, I sort of think of it like this. I use this analogy quite frequently in my classes. You know, if you walked into my office, let's say you were visiting me on campus, and you saw me hitting my office mate with a baseball bat, you would not automatically assume that I like baseball. You wouldn't be like, wow, <laughs> Amber is such a baseball fan, right? Similarly, sexual violence isn't always about sex. It's rather it's gaining and retaining power and control over another person. So that's one rape myth that I see it's sort of permeated our culture. The first one that you're seeing here, you know, that it isn't really sexual assault, it's a misunderstanding. We sort of see that trope quite frequently. Um, same thing with these sort of excusatory statements, boys will be boys. Um, you know, we see this ranging from small children all the way up. Um, what about victims lie? I see this <laughs> way too often actually in this work where there's an argument that there is this, oh, the criminal justice sort of system is sort of a wash um, with those who um, perpetuate lies about sexual violence. And again, that's, that's not true. Um, the research tell us, tells us that false reports are actually incredibly rare. <laughs> An estimated 2 to 8% of all reported cases of sexual assault um, happen to be um, falsified. You know, 
that that's out of the reported cases. You know, we know that the large majority of cases of sexual violence are never reported um, to authorities. I think a good example of this rape myth that victims lie um, is the whole Bill Cosby situation that we see playing out here. Bill Cosby has had more than 50 women accuse him of sexual violence and all in startlingly some ways. Despite that fact though, despite that 50 plus women have come forward, there are still people who outwardly deny that it happened at all and would even go as far to say that the victims are lying or that they're gold diggers. Um, yes, Amber, I actually did say two to eight percent. I'm looking, or Ashley, excuse me, I'm looking at the chat box now. Um, let's see. Uh, sexual assault is most often perpetrated by deranged strangers. We see that quite often. This is perhaps one of the most pervasive myths in our culture, where we conceptualize rape as something that's highly violent, perpetrated by a stranger, and it results in a victim immediately reporting to police. However, the research tells us we know that most cases of sexual violence, there is little physical violence taking place. The victim knows the perpetrator and the victim rarely reports to police. So sort of the polar opposite of our antiquated conceptualization of what sexual assault looks like. I think that pathologizing perpetrators of rape as these like deranged strangers who are running around at night sort of allows us to not only narrowly define what rape looks like, but it also provides us with some cognitive dissonance. Um, you know, I think that men who assault women sans any degree of force or verbal coercion, they're not framed as sexual uh, assault perpetrators. It's, you know, these we sort of frame that as seemingly normal men who made a harmless mistake. Um, I think that this rape myth in particular also leads us to fail it sort of it makes it difficult for us to label sexual violence as what it is. Um, the next one here, you cannot be assaulted by your partner. Um, we know that that's not true. Um, actually, there is uh, in, in the field that I work in, we call that intimate partner sexual violence. And that's actually quite common within relationships um, containing intimate partner violence. Um, so you absolutely can be perpetrated against by someone who is close to you. Um, the second to last one here, uh, men cannot be sexually assaulted. You, you know, we know that's not true. Indeed, the statistics tell us otherwise. One in 16 men while they're here on a college campus will be sexually assaulted. You know, it's true, however, you know, for particularly for men who are victims, they face additional barriers to reporting. Um, in fact, I want to pose that question to you all out there um, listening. Why do you think for men in particular, it can be difficult to report sexual violence? Um, why do you think that it would be harder for men in particular to come forward to say, listen, I've been, I've been assaulted and I need help? Or even women, why do you think that, you know, it might be difficult for women to come forward? Shame, absolutely. Yes, I, Courtney said one that's pretty, pretty pervasive. You should have been strong enough to defend myself. Very good. Um, Ashley said, maybe they could be embarrassed. They don't think people believe them. Yeah, Maria, very good. Gender roles, masculinity would dictate that, you know, you're supposed to be able to, um, you know, fight off any potential attacks or thwart any attacks. Um, yes, absolutely, Tony. They, they may not absolutely think that anyone will believe them. Michael says, men don't want to admit weakness and men in law enforcement may not want to hear it. Um, Erica said, when it's a younger guy with an older woman, his peers act as if he should like it. Absolutely. We see this quite often as the response when female teachers perpetrate against students. Um, we don't see that reaction, however, when a male teacher perpetrates against students. Very, very good. Um, we're seeing that, um, yeah, absolutely. There's some apportions, a large portion of attacks that occur within male dominated spaces. Very good. Absolutely. So all these things sort of, you know, uh, create a situation where victims do not come forward, right? All of these sort of elements that we're talking about. Um, the last one here is something I like to talk about given how technology has permeated our culture. And I sort of see uh, a distinction when people talk about violence between embodied harm versus disembodied harm. So I see embodied harm as um, an actual harm taking place in quote unquote the real world, maybe offline. Uh, maybe this could be an instance of sexual assault, an instance of stalking. 
Um, disembodied harm could be something like we're going to talk about later, like online harassment. Um, I, you know, I believe that both of these forms of harm are equally important to talk about regardless of the space, but we definitely see the sort of distinction here. Um, moving forward in the instance of time, let's go to the next one here, risk reduction strategies. So this is where I'm going to ask you for um, some input as well. What strategies do you all employ to protect yourself from sexual violence? Um, I know for me, I can think of one right off the bat that actually my dad sort of told me about. He gave me a pepper spray before I went away to college. Um, and I, you know, used to carry that on my keychain or out and about when I was jogging. So if you all could just write in the chat box, oh, they're already popping in here. So Courtney said, carry pepper spray when I run. Absolutely. Amber said, never leave a drink alone at a bar. Kara said, the body system. Yes, very good. Um, Naya said, if I work late, I always walk out to the car in a group. Very good. Um, moderator said, don't drink too much. Very good. Lots of pepper sprays on here. Absolutely. Um, so we do sort of see this. We're trained for this sort of, especially women, since we were very young. Um, yeah, always have a key ready for your door, park under a street light, um, all of these sorts of things. You all are coming up with some really great examples. Um, I, so I put some on here on the slide, you know, if, in case we didn't touch on them, but it's things that I even think about, you know, and many of my friends think about as we sort of walk through life, right? And specifically my friends who identify as women. So I do things like make sure my car doors are locked as soon as I get in. Um, you know, I carry, we, like we just said in the chat box, all of you are carrying pepper spray or you're parking under a street light, you know, you're looking in your car before you get in it, using the buddy system, using self-defense. You know, I, I've even been told to use the reflective surfaces of windows near me to ensure that no one is following me. Um, I feel like as a woman, I sort of have to be hyper vigilant and aware of my surroundings. Um, actually, Autumn in the chat box said that, yes, yeah, sometimes I hold my keys between my fingers. Very good. <laughs> yes, very good. Um, I actually, I, I'll tell you another story. My dad got me um, uh, an inner city defense pencil when I uh, moved away to grad school. And I'll tell you what that is in case you don't know. It's basically, it looks like a normal pencil, but you push the button and like a Game of Thrones looking sword comes out. Um, it's quite the thing. <laughs> And I think my dad thinks I'm going to gouge someone's eyes out or something like that. <laughs> but it's essentially a pencil um, that I can use in the event that I'm ever attacked. But again, it's I'm constantly thinking about these things. Um, Angela in the chat box actually just said, I have a tool on my key ring. <laughs> um, very good. Absolutely. So all of these things we sort of constantly think about. And I think that women in particular are constantly thinking about these things because we live in a culture where sexual violence is normalized and we have this sort of rhetoric where we have to prevent it from happening. So when I talk about risk reduction, again, I'm talking about things that sort of perpetuate the don't get raped message versus the don't rape message. Um, so all of these sort of self-protective strategies that we employ. Um, and then also this sort of, uh, our country is awash with anti-rape products, um, like this nail polish actually recently came out. Um, and the people who developed this nail polish were actually very benevolent in their, um, you know, their sort of development of this product. But it's nail polish where if you put it on your fingers and you're out at a bar, if you dip your finger in a drink, you can, the nail polish will change color if there are any date rape drugs in your drink. Um, you know, that's fantastic that someone thought of that. But, you know, it leads me to a couple of questions here. What if I'm out with someone that I trust? You know, if I'm out with someone that I trust, I'm not going to automatically assume, you know, they're going to do anything harmful to me. So why would I wear that nail polish that night? Or why would I even think to use it? Um, you know, another thing along these lines um, uh, is that when if I were to wear this nail polish, I mean, Day rape drugs are used, but alcohol is actually the number one drug used to facilitate sexual violence. So it sort of, um, you know, defeats the purpose, so to speak. Um, there are also belts that sort of lock your pants on um, so they won't come off in the event of an assault. Um, there's also alarms that are available for you. Uh, there's also, interestingly enough, I put stockings up here because there was a product that looked, it was stockings, but they looked like hairy legs. 
Um, and this was marketed as an anti-rape product because apparently I think the messaging therein was obviously very oppressive and ridiculous, but that if you had hairy legs that you would not be sexually assaulted uh, for some reason. So yes, this, this is some, you can Google that, that is a thing. Um, there's also anti-rape clothing that makes it very difficult um, not to get off in the event of assault, so on and so forth. Um, I, I think that risk reduction, I don't wanna sort of make this into something that's diminutive. I, you know, I really do believe that you should protect yourself, um, but I also think the messaging is coming from a not great place. Um, I think we're, it's coming from messaging inherent to rape culture. Uh, some recent research, though, has indicated that risk reduction paired with messaging about empowering women and dispelling sort of all of these myths, um, that's sort of been useful to counteract sexual violence. So, of course, we don't want to take risk reduction or this don't get raped messaging in isolation. If that is paired with empowering messaging, it can be helpful. So I, I, I'm not against sort of, you know, going out there and protecting yourself. You absolutely should. Um, but I think that the crux of some of these products and strategies are really rooted in the foundations of rape culture. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move forward here um, and talk about the next element, which is victim blaming. Um, I highly recommend this book. You'll see at the bottom here, I put the book name. It's Kate Harding. Her book is Asking For It. It is a very easy read. I always have my students read it when I teach violence towards women, um, which is a criminal justice class in my department. Uh, I, I really think it's an easy sort of book to read and sort of digest all of these issues. But she has this really great quote in her book, and it says, women are no more important than any other potential victim, but we are the primary targets of the messages and myths that sustain rape culture. Anyone can be raped, but men aren't conditioned to live in terror of it, nor are they constantly warned that their clothing, travel choices, alcohol consumptions, and expressions of sexuality are likely to bring violations upon them. This is a pretty profound quote. <laughs> um, and I, I sort of see this as uh, sort of the crux of our conversation about victim blaming. Because in, in a rape culture, the actions of the victim rather than the perpetrator are automatically scrutinized before, during, and after an assault. Unless the victim and the sexual assault in question meets that very narrow and antiquated conceptualization of sexual violence, i.e. stranger violence, um, we're remiss to denote that as sexual violence. You know, for example, again, we expect victims to be victimized by a stranger, to fight back, to show physical and emotional trauma, to immediately tell law enforcement, to be able to regale law enforcement of that trauma without any inconsistencies or hesitation. And if a victim doesn't fit this very narrow mold, let's say there's no obvious physical trauma, let's say a victim fails to tell law enforcement immediately, let's say the assault is not perpetrated by a stranger, but maybe by the victim's spouse or um, it, maybe by their, their partner, maybe by a friend, you know, that immediately leaves room in our culture to question its occurrence. So common victim blaming sentiments that I see often involve questioning a victim's sexual history, questioning a victim's amount of alcohol consumption, and questioning the style of dress uh, that a victim wore given a certain scenario. You know, victim blaming has gone so far that we see this play out in news media, right? The Steubenville case is a fantastic example of that. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar or remember the Steubenville case. Um, this is where a 16-year-old was sexually assaulted at a party while she was unconscious by um, some high school athletes. Um, they actually assaulted her, documented it, <laughs> bragged about it as so on social media, and then the media, in regaling us with this story, framed the victim as, as a career ruiner. She was hurting these football players by having this happen. She shouldn't have drank that much. Um, these, these, these guys had such promising football careers. How, how dare she you know, come forward with this? Or how, how dare we sort of scrutinize this? This was a big case. And you can actually look up on YouTube if you just search like Steubenville uh, news media response or something along those lines. You'll see how major news networks were framing this blaming the victim and exonerating the perpetrators and even like sort of feeling bad for the perpetrators in these scenarios. So in so many cases of sexual violence, victims are blamed. 
Either they blame themselves because of all of these things we're sort of talking about tonight, other people blame them, and then there's some combination of both, right? But this is a big element of rape culture where we're blaming victims and exonerating perpetrators and scrutinizing victim behavior before we ever um, sort of look at perpetrator behavior in these scenarios. So in the interest of time, I have to keep moving forward. I could talk about this for so long, um, but we have to move on to the next one, which is uh, next element of rape culture, which is slut shaming. So this is labeling a woman who expresses her sexuality as a slut. So this expression of sexuality, mind you, can be real or presumed. It doesn't actually have to be real. Um, so we see this quite often in this double standard for men and women where men's sexual expression is normalized and glorified and women are chastised for their expressions of their sexuality. So we sort of can think about this in terms of how many names we have for women who express their derogatory names uh, for women who express their sexuality versus men. So a few off the top of my head here, um, uh, we see the word um, slut used, we see the word whore used for women, floozy, uh, the word skank. Um, we sort of see this quite frequently for women when they're expressing their sexuality. But we don't have a lot of words for men, right, that are necessarily um, demeaning in terms of this. So we do have the word womanizer for men. That's, you know, has a negative connotation. But then we also say things like stud or ladies man. Maybe he's a player, maybe he's a pimp, right? So this sort of double standard exists where women are degraded for their expressions of sexuality and men are lauded. Um, slut shaming sort of occurs within this culture that engages in a lot of sexual double standard, or excuse me, a lot of sexual double standards in which men are lauded for uh, sexually permissive behavior and women are punished, maybe sometimes even socially ostracized. Um, it's sort of this virgin whore dichotomy, right, in our culture where you have to be sexy to a certain point because we're living in a culture that dictates that as normal, but also you can't be too sexy. And you have to be sexual, but you can't be too sexual. But you can't be prudish either, but you don't want to be whorish. It's, it's sort of this like no-win situation where I think women exist in this space where this double standard, standard is as such that you know, no matter what we do, we're going to be scrutinized um, for expressing our sexuality too much or not enough in a way that is palatable to some and not not. It, it's quite uh, quite a situation. Um, sort of an example of slut shaming and victim blaming uh, that I always comes to mind when I'm thinking about this is there was a New York Times article that was reporting on the gang rape of an 11 year old girl by 18 men who recorded the act. Um, so in this New York Times piece of the, when they were regaling us with this case or this gang rape that took place in Texas, I believe, um, the, the New York Times writer denoted that the victim dressed a certain way, wore makeup, and often associated with teenage boys. So what is that telling us? Um, the writer was quick to note an 11-year-old girl who was gang raped well, she wore makeup, you know, she might have dressed provocatively and she definitely associated with older boys, an 11 year old girl. I mean, I think of that and I think if an 11 year old girl who is victimized can be blamed for that, you know, imagine all of the other victims who outwardly have more agency, um, you know, and how they can be blamed for an assault. I mean, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, in the interest of time, I have to continue moving forward. I, again, I, I keep wanting to talk about all of these things in depth. Um, but this, again, is a double standard that exists within our culture. Um, the second one, or the last, next to last one here is normalizing harassment. So women are more likely to be targeted for harassment, specifically in male-dominated spaces, than men. Um, we see this with street harassment. So street harassment, if you don't know exactly what that means, that's otherwise known as catcalling. Um, it happens frequently on the street to women where men will yell things at them on public transportation and you know on the street, whatever. Um, I actually encourage you to watch a video on YouTube. It's called 10 Hours of Walking in New York City as a Woman. It'll give you some additional perspective on what this looks like. Um, you know, I think that street harassment is sort of framed within a rape culture that it tells conventionally attractive women that they should expect street harassment and that women who do not meet conventional standards of beauty should appreciate street harassment. So you sort of see this insidiousness um, even within street harassment. 
I actually experienced street harassment um, when I was in Las Vegas. Um, that will be the first and last time I ever go to Vegas. Um, it was an experience. I did it once and it was fine. Um, but I experienced this. I was walking. So I'm sort of a morning person. I'm one of those awful people who gets up really early and is super chipper. Um, so I got up really early one morning. It was like seven in the morning. My partner at the time, he didn't want to get out of bed. So I said, well, okay, I'm going to walk across the strip. I'm going to go get some breakfast. So that's what I did. I was, you know, stone cold sober at 7 a.m. I'm excited to go get this breakfast at the other end of the strip. So I'm walking down the strip and I see this group of men in front of me. There's about seven or eight men in the group. Mind you, this is 7 a.m. Now, as a woman, I kind of know what's going to happen. I kind of can see how rowdy they are. I kind of knew that I was going to get harassed as I walked by. But I had to walk there anyway. There was no other way for me to walk around them. So I walked by them. They harassed me. I won't tell you what they said, but you know, it was uncomfortable at best. As I was walking by them, I happened to see two other men um, approaching me from the other direction. So they were sort of walking towards me. These were older men. They looked like someone's dad. And I thought, oh good, <laughs> these individuals are gonna help me, right? They're gonna say something. And they did stop me a little bit after uh, we passed the men who were street harassing me. And they said to me, sweetheart, you shouldn't be walking down the strip by yourself. And I, I, I was a little bit too stunned <laughs> to say anything as a retort to that. But the implication was that I, I shouldn't be walking alone. Not that these men shouldn't be harassing me, that, but that at seven in the morning when I'm still cold sober going to get my breakfast, I should not be doing that. So street ha let's just say street harassment happens all the time. Um, and it can happen in a wide variety of spaces and exceedingly uncomfortable. Um, there's also online harassment that takes place of women. Um, this is where women are you know, verbally abused online in a variety of spaces. This could be anywhere from in the comment sections of online, um, even in online dating, maybe in, on websites. It could be um, within gaming. Um, so they're subject to verbal abuse, cyber stalking. Um, sometimes other users will threaten them with violence um, when women are interacting online. In fact, I, I actually, Ashley, I'm looking at the chat box. She said gaming all the time. Yes, absolutely. In fact, I was doing this presentation for a class last semester, and I asked the students, much like I'm asking you all, you know, uh, what does online harassment look like? Have you ever experienced it? And one of the women raised their hands and said, yeah, I actually can show you. I was playing Yahtzee on my phone. She said, look at all. I didn't, she said, I didn't realize the chat box was open on the Yahtzee thing. I was just trying to play Yahtzee. And she showed me all of these disgusting messages she was getting. All she was doing was playing Yahtzee on her phone. <laughs> like it, it was absolutely bananas to me. Um, but I, you know, I'm actually seeing in the chat box now. We see, yes, absolutely Tinder. We see uh, all kinds of unsolicited uh, pictures and nudes that are being sent to individuals. Absolutely. Um, someone actually just commented, I have guys ask me if I'm married. I tell them I am. Then they proceed to harass me anyway. And that's actually sort of one of the problems that we see within this is that we have to sort of exert that, uh, you know, we have a boyfriend or a husband or something like that in order to get harassment to stop. And then sometimes it doesn't stop after that. It's, it's really ugh, it's insidious. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I, I do want to tell you about this example of online harassment that a pretty prominent feminist on online, um, she's a, she's an author. She's fantastic. Her name's Jessica Valenti that she experienced online harassment on Twitter. I mean, she constantly experiences it, but this one time she actually experienced it to the point where she woke up, got on Twitter, and there were people who were threatening, and again, I can't make this up, to rape and murder her five-year-old daughter. So online misogynistic trolls on Twitter <laughs> were threatening to rape and murder her daughter. She actually tweeted in response to this. She said, this morning I woke up to a rape and death threat directed at my five-year-old daughter. This part of my work life is unacceptable. This occurs all the time. Um, you know, I, it, in fact, it occurs so much that we see it as normal and, and expected in most settings. Um, and in fact, I recently was reading a piece <clears throat> Um, that talked about online harassment that said, you know, a lot of famous people or journalists, like if they're not getting harassed online, it's sort of, they're sort of using it as a, a litmus test of how famous they are, right? Like if you're not receiving this sort of online misogyny, you know, you haven't made it, so to speak. Um, it, it's quite insidious, but we see this as normal and expected when we're working in online spaces. Um, I wanna get to questions here, so I do wanna sort of <laughs> move forward. Um, so media influences are huge uh, when it comes to uh, sexual violence. 
you know, we see this, we talked about advertising where women are being objectified. There's music out there where lyrics are so <laughs> misogynistic, it's almost astounding. In fact, there's one that I hear every Christmas that's quite astounding. I don't know if anybody can guess in the chat box which Christmas song I'm denoting as being inherent to rape culture. Uh, but there's this one song around Christmas um, that sort of, yes, absolutely, Amber in the chat box said, baby, it's cold outside. <laughs> Very good. If you go ahead and look up those lyrics, the bulk of that is coercive in nature. Um, you know, I really can't stay. Uh, that should be it. <laughs> you should just say, okay, you can't stay. That's fine. But we see this sort of pulling and prodding um, at this individual song. Uh, Michael said, yep, the worst song ever. <laughs> and Nia said, what's in this drink? Yeah, absolutely. We're normalizing date rape drugs in these songs that, you know, our parents and grandparents sing on, you know, Christmas or whatever. Um, so yeah, oh, Maria brought up blurred lines. Very good. I was going to actually mention that. That's sort of the newer sort of I, iconic song that talks about uh, sexual violence. It's absolutely terrible. Um, we see this all the time in television, movies. Um, a lot of my research is on pornography, so there's a lot of tropes within that that are violent towards women. So you know, keep that in mind. Um, I do want to get to because we're swiftly running out of time here. I, I, I said a lot of things tonight, and I wish I could talk to you all for so much longer because you all have been such a great audience and very communicative with me. But I don't want to leave you with just, you know, like, hey, this is rape culture. Okay, go live your best lives, right? Like, that would be weird to me to just leave it there. So I really want to talk to you right now about how you can mitigate the impact of rape culture because I think that's very important. Um, number one, I think you should be critical of the media you consume. That can be exhausting, admittedly. Um, rape culture is sort of everywhere. It's sort of in, it's omnipotent in our lives. But I think that we can be critical of what we consume in a way that sort of, um, you know, just framing what we're viewing in a critical lens is really what I'm getting at here. Um, the second one here, be an active bystander. You know, if you see someone perpetuating rape culture, you know, check them on it. If you hear victim blaming sentiments, you know, if you hear someone say, well, what was she wearing? You know, how much did she have to drink? Something like that. You know, you check them on it. Say, that's not okay. You know, that's not a good question to ask. You're victim blaming right now, and I don't appreciate it, right? Just standing up, um, sort of stepping in when you hear this stuff happening, and, and you will. Um, the third thing here is listen, support, and believe survivors. So when someone comes to you, they need help, they've been victimized, listen to them, support them, and believe them. And this sort of coincides with the next one, with knowing your resources on campus and in the community. And right now I want to switch really quickly to show you um, your resources here on campus on the OEO website. So the Office for Equal Opportunity, hopefully you all can see that. Um, you can see here that there are resources and reporting options, all the different flyers for resources on different campuses here. So be mindful that that exists for you. And you can find that on oeo.wsu.edu. Self-care, self-care, self-care. You know, if you're talking about these issues with friends, if you, you know, are researching this, be mindful that it's going to be very, very difficult to talk about um, and take care of yourselves while doing so. Um, up your self-care game, so to speak, um, when you're having these conversations, because they can be really, really hard. Um, so again, uh, rape culture normalizes and glorifies sexual violence, leaves um, perpetrators to flourish, and uh, silences and blames victims. But it can be mitigated by people like you. I, I have all the faith in the world in all of you out there um, that you can help me work myself out of a job so we don't have to have these conversations anymore. But it can be mitigated by you. If you want to learn more, I highly encourage you to look some of these things up. So there's actually a couple of really great documentaries on masculinity and how that relates to violence. One of them is The Mask I Live In, a um, fantastic recent documentary on how young boys are socialized within this culture. Um, Bro Code, that's a little bit of an older documentary, but still really great, talks about sexism within our culture and sexual violence. Um, you can actually look up these two TED Talks, actually, at the end of this uh, webinar. One of them is Tony Porter, and the other is Jackson Katz. Again, do really great work around masculinity and sort of getting men involved with dealing with these issues. Um, some books you can read. Uh, I just got done reading Girls and Sex, Navigating the Complicated New Landscape, and it was a fantastic book. Same thing with Sex Object by Jessica Valenti, and like I said, Asking For is also a great book. I would highly recommend any of these things.
Um, it, with the exception of the documentaries, you can find all of these online, you know, your local bookstore, or what have you. Um, and I would encourage you to pick those up. Um, all right. So I sort of flew through that because I wanted to get to questions. So does anyone have any questions for me? Oh, I, oh, Michael has a question. As a dad of three daughters, I really appreciate, or a statement maybe, um, I really appreciated the continued attention to this issue. Parents are key to breaking this culture. Thank you, Michael. I appreciate that. I actually don't want human children myself, so I need people like you out there doing awesome and, you know, sort of parenting and, you know, around these issues and bringing these conversations up. So fantastic. Thank you, Michael. 